Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman, coming to you live and direct from Honolulu, Hawaii, actually Kailua, which is in the county of Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, I've been on the road a whole lot in July, a lot of traveling, some to the mainland, um, a bunch to the Big Island. And that's given me a lot of time to think about things and a lot of time to observe things going on. But I think when I got home from my last um, trip, I made, maybe it was a tactical error. I actually looked at the news for a while. And that really makes you start to wonder about society right now. It's just, you know, I, I kind of want to think people are getting stupid, but maybe they're just getting lazy. I'm not sure. But it's really, it's really kind of annoying to me because I've done a bunch of shows that I've, where I talked about experts and how we can't be listening to experts all the time. We have to literally sit down and get our hands dirty or get our fingers into things and start doing things and researching personally and, and investing a little more time. We've talked about critical analysis, where you really have to go into second, third order effects when you start to make a decision on technology and really, really think. I mean, that's what we have brains for, is to think. I've also pounded the table on good design for starting you know, a project. If you're going to build something or if you're going to design something new, you need to really think about the function, uh, the materials, where the materials come from, what happens at end of life on the materials, all that cradle to grave stuff that I've talked about also. And maybe it's just that most people lack perspective and real appreciation for expending time and expending energy. What I mean is, that kind of gets back to my lazy comment. Maybe it's not that we have forgotten how to do all those critical analysis and cradle to grave analysis and critical thinking. And, you know, maybe it's just that we've kind of forgotten how hard it is to really do work. And this is an energy show. And the whole idea of expending energy is to get work done. The reason that we have a society that focuses on energy right now is because we use computers, we use machines, we use technology to make our work faster and better. And when computers first came out, computers were the, the the justification for every person or every family or every household having a computer was it would make us so much more efficient that we would have more free time to relax and enjoy our families and do things. Tell me, is that what the computers have done in our world today? We've got phones that could design the space shuttle. They take pictures. They can communicate voice. They can take video. They can communicate via text. They can stream images in, uh, they can stream messages out. They can tell you where you're at, flat long down to the probably the square meter. They follow you, they gather data on you, they sell the data to other people. That's just your phone, just in the last few years. But I think we've forgotten how hard it is to really work. So I was thinking in a personal sense, Maybe this is the problem today. The generations that have grown up in the 80s and 90s, or at least the 90s and the 2000s, really just don't understand the concept of energy and work and time, the way us older generation thinks about them. For example, imagine you're in college now, because I, I got my master's fairly late in life. I was in my 50s. And I was totally shocked when I saw all the tools available to a college student when they actually had to do their term papers and things. When I did my term papers in bat for my bachelor's degree, I had a typewriter. And I was lucky, I had an electric typewriter. But the problem was your professors wanted no typos on your paper. So you could sit there and type a whole page of paperwork and you make a spelling error and you can't use whiteout 
and you can't use correcting tape and you can't use you have to pull the paper out and start typing that whole page all over again. I think if students had to do that today, they would probably all revolt and and just refuse to do any any work because it's too hard. Maybe that's why people in my generation appreciate the technology we have and the kind of time savings and energy savings that these beautiful machines and technology get us, you know, to do. So can you imagine, you know, what it's like if that stuff goes away? I, I can, because when I go to the big island, I live in a cabin out in the woods with no electricity, no water, no toilets. And I get by. Amazing. And all the only electricity I use is generally a little bit of battery power from my truck. And I just recharge my battery when I'm driving. But anyway, what really kind of got me started on this, this whole topic of people just don't understand, you know, really thinking hard about stuff and, and the whole energy concept was I had a really great meeting last week with, with one of our political leaders. And we were discussing um, energy efficient vehicles and, and clean transportation. And during the conversation, one of my colleagues mentioned that he had forwarded an article on electric buses and wanted to know if the rest of the group on the Zoom meeting had received the article. And everybody said, oh yeah, we got it. And then one of the gentlemen on the meeting said, yeah, but you know, that really ticked me off. And, and all of us just kind of went, whoa. It was it was really a good informational article. He goes, I don't want to be talking about batteries and hydrogen and competing and having a war between batteries and hydrogen and transportation. We need all these technologies to work together to give us the solutions we need. And we all agreed with that. In fact, we've said that several times, but apparently he mistook the article as a criticism of batteries. But it wasn't a criticism of batteries. It was a criticism of design. It was a criticism of failure to do critical thinking. It was a criticism because the people making that technology failed to do cradle to grave analysis. It was a criticism of making bad choices because somebody who is more like a lobbyist or a sales jerk was pushing technology to different municipalities and then they realized that their their process their their product wasn't meeting customer expectations so instead of going back to the drawing board and redesigning these happen to be electric buses they just threw a bunch more batteries on the electric buses and if you have any engineering background at all or any common sense you know that you can't just go and throw a couple tons of weight on a vehicle that hits potholes and bumps and, and pulls lateral G's and stuff like that without causing structural issues. So the big picture in the story was that there's there are certain companies that are trying to get out ahead of everybody else and get out there and get their product known and, and their, their face out there, their branding on the on the streets and hit all of these um, companies or or municipalities or cities that have rapid transit systems and get their bus on the market on the line first. And they BS some of them, they just push it really hard. They, um, you might call this corruption, but they take a whole lot of municipal bus um, heads of uh, departments and stuff out to dinner and schmooze them. And next thing you know, these counties and cities and municipalities are buying these buses and committed to big contracts. And then all of a sudden, a couple of cities say, hey, we've got 20 of these buses and 18 of them are down for hard broke chassis because the batteries crack the chassis. So what I'm trying to say, when, when I title this to the show, it's about Make energy, not war. We have to decouple the marketing and the corporate, you know, obnoxiousness is 
is the best way I can describe it, that we, we push sometimes, especially when we push it to politicians and say, hey, we've got a technology and we spent a lot of time researching it and we've done our homework and this is what it can really do. If they can't do that, you need to be upfront about it. You need to be honest about it. If you need to improve your product or change your product or put limits on your product, you need to do that. Because if you don't, you have things like we have in Honolulu where you have a $3 billion rail project that has suddenly ballooned to about $12 billion. $12 billion is an entire squadron of B-2 bombers. And the Congress wouldn't even fund more than a couple squadrons of B-2s because they were too freaking expensive. Well, the county of Honolulu certainly can't afford a project that has gone three, six, nine, twelve, four times over budget and still growing and late to need as well. But that's the kind of decision making we see a lot of times by government, local, state, and federal when it comes to latching onto projects. And it all goes back to failure to do good design, failure to apply critical analysis, failure to do cradle to grave analysis, and just being in a big hurry. You know, being in a big hurry, does that ring any bells with some of you with the Green New Deal? In 10 years, if we're not all cleaned up carbon wise, we're all gonna die. You know, it's a big threat. Everybody's jumping on this bandwagon and pushing stuff left and right, pushing technology faster than it should go. I can tell you there's one business law, that an economic law that never, ever fails. It's almost as good as supply and demand. And that is, if you want it fast, you're going to pay a premium for it. If you need it in a hurry, you're going to pay way too much. You need to sit down and put this thing in perspective. Time it the way you need to, to buy it in the right time frame, when the technology's developed right, when the, the economies of scale have gotten caught up, when the scale of the whole project is where it needs to be. And if you have to start slow and build up, so be it. But if you rush, I guarantee you're going to pay too much. And it turns out today that paying too much is not just talking about paying dollars for a product, but making big mistakes that cost huge dollars in the long run. And unfortunately, when governments make big mistakes, it's taxpayer dollars that get spent because the government doesn't, other than the federal government, print money. And when the government, the federal government prints money, you can almost guarantee it's inflation. It's going to catch everybody as, like a tax at some point. So we, I, keep, I keep harping on this critical analysis and cradle to grave analysis and really thinking because I think we've gotten too lazy with computers, with, with iPhones, with iPads, with cell phones. We've just gotten too lazy to do the real nug work that it takes to really get through a project. So when we had this meeting, this government meeting, we got it back on track. And, and I explained to the gentleman in probably much nicer terms than I did just now, that the real issue with the article wasn't our hydrogen buses better than electric buses because they're both electric buses. It's just that that company did a poor job of getting their product out too soon before it was properly designed and marketed. And that what we need to do is we need to find the right tool for the right job. So to focus in a little bit on the energy war I was talking about, when I'm a hydrogen person, I really support hydrogen fuel cell technology. I think it's the right answer. I know it's not perfect, but it's really, in my view, a lot more perfect than almost any other solution I've ever seen. And furthermore, as it develops, as we develop new technology, most of the developments that we have are going to actually help hydrogen. I don't dislike batteries, but there are certain aspects of batteries that aren't compatible with transportation. One of them is weight. There is no way that batteries can ever compete with hydrogen or weight as a energy storage solution. But that's not the only reason you choose. Maybe batteries are cheaper in some respects 
and you can get more energy in the energy out. So maybe battery buses that travel relatively level terrain and travel only certain routes and have a time to recharge and stuff where you can stop them and plug them in for six hours or whatever to get a charge without having to spend a lot of money on rapid charging technology. Maybe those battery buses fill the bill in certain areas. And maybe hydrogen buses fill the bill when you have a lot of terrain, or you have long distances, or you have, you have challenges with the technology that hydrogen overcomes. So hydrogen isn't as efficient as batteries, but it's much better at long range transportation and climbing hills and things like that and battery technologies because the batteries weigh too much. But battery and hydrogen people, what I've noticed is battery people almost hate hydrogen. They, they, as soon as anybody criticizes a battery vehicle, they immediately come back and say, well, hydrogen's, you know, Elon Musk hates it, it's inefficient, and it costs too much, and infrastructure is not there. And it's like, just hold on, hold on. We need both. We need battery plug-in, we need hybrids, and we need plug-in, we need um, fuel cell electric vehicles, all of them. We need to get all those technologies rolling and do them well and get them out there safely, efficiently, effectively, so that we can solve the issues that face our society now, which is we're trying to reduce fossil fuel use. And we should be saving that fossil fuel, those organic uh, oil and things like that that are available for future generations to make durable goods with, instead of arguing over whether coal and oil and natural gas you know, should be eliminated today, or maybe we should find some ways to, use, to, to back down off of natural gas and coal, coal and oil in a nice, steady, programmed direction that keeps the, price, the prices from going volatile and solves things. So I'd like to propose that we really look hard when we're discussing technology and energy at finding what solutions work best and picking technologies and companies that really work hard at critical analysis and cradle to grave. So, you know, there's so many things. I did a paper for the Air Force one time where I sat down and listed, I think it was like 11 different considerations for energy. And I was comparing batteries to hydrogen. And in some cases, well, and, and natural gas, by the way, in some cases, batteries won. In some cases, hydrogen won. In some cases, natural gas won. In terms of like safety, weight, um, availability, price, um, different technologies and, and ways of using them. Um, it was it was a really, I thought, a very broad look at um, the pluses and minuses of those technologies. And what I did was I said, okay, well, hydrogen won here and batteries won there and natural gas won there. And when you added up the scores for this particular use, which happened to be in support equipment for the Air Force, the hydrogen came out way ahead. It wasn't the winner in every category. But when you took all of the cradle to grave discussion and lined it up and said, okay, which one works best because of safety? Which one has the least amount of rare earth metals involved or materials we have to purchase from other countries that are become a national security issue? You know, when you add all those things in and, and put the scores out, you can pick the best technology. I just don't think that a whole lot of people are using that kind of technique, that kind of analysis when it comes to picking the right things as we try and eliminate fossil fuels from our daily life, which is a good goal. Whether you're a climate change person or not, I mean, like I said it before on the show, and had people actually give me heat for it. If you wouldn't want to wrap your lips around the exhaust pipe of your car and breathe it, then we shouldn't be doing that technology. You know, it's like, just common sense. It's, it's, I wasn't meant to shock anybody, but you know, if it's not good enough to breathe it yourself, then why are we letting it out into the air? That's a problem we're solving. 
climate change or no climate change. That's a problem we have to fix. So as we as we look at developing new technologies and whether we sell them to the private sector or to government, I think one of the most important things we have to also consider is whether it makes economic sense on its own merit. Um, one of the things that I've seen um, over the last two decades is things like cap and trade, uh, wh where you basically give people, you pay people to use less carbon and people that, that, that put out a lot of carbon, CO2 and stuff, you basically tax them and you can trade these credits back and forth and things like that. Tax breaks for certain technologies, subsidies for certain technologies, grants for certain technologies. And this is all government money that gets injected into the private sector to help incentivize good decisions. And to a certain degree, I'm, I'm all for the carrot and the stick approach. You know, that's what governments use. Basically, they either reward you or they spank you, they either tax you or they, or they reward you, give you a tax break for certain things that you do. And to a degree, I guess that's okay, but I think it's kind of gotten out of control. And my point is, if a company can't make a profit on its product in the competitive um, you know, space, economic space they're in, um, then it's probably not the right time for that product. And if it is, maybe it just needs a little incentive that incentive, should, if it's a government tax break or something, should be there for a limited time and stop. So the example I'll, I'll give you of a bad example is California. And I'm a hydrogen guy. I love hydrogen. In California, they've subsidized hydrogen stations to the tune of 50% of the cost of the station. And they've been doing that for a decade, which is great, except they still haven't made, met their first hundred station goal, they just haven't done it. So the taxpayers are, are paying and paying and paying and they're not meeting the goal. And I just saw an article a little while ago where they want to build more stations and the peak, the companies that want to build more stations are going, well, where's the next round of money coming from for the government to incentivize us to build it? In other words, these companies are depending on the government to subsidize them just to keep their profit, you know, their, their profit margins up. I think that's a bad place to end up when we're talking about government spending. So you can translate that into energy issues. You can translate it into uh, military industrial complex spending. You know, you've, you've heard of the $10,000 toilets and things that, that they see in, in DOD spending. Those kind of things are just a little out of control. Well, not to be a, a um, worry wart, um, I did read a really great article in Pacific Business News this week, and I wanted to read it to you. It's not a real long article, but it's a good news thing. And it's a good news thing because here in Hawaii, we have Hawaiian Electric that runs the public electric utilities virtually on all the islands except for one island, the island of Kauai. And Kauai has the uh, distinction of having their own utility cooperative. It's called Kauai Island Util Utility Cooperative, KIUC for short. And they just received an award. And I like to brag about companies that receive awards for doing the right thing. And these guys do. And, and I'm telling you this, even though I've talked to them about using hydrogen and they've said, we're not gonna use hydrogen. And here's why. And the reason was we don't feel like the, the the industry is ready for taking that kind of risk. So we're intentionally not looking at hydrogen for energy storage, not that we won't in the future, but our current um, corporate philosophy is we won't take risk in energy storage right now. And, and I went, wow. So anyway, they won an award. So this article was written by Mr. Brian McInnes uh, from Pacific Business News. He's a reporter at Pacific Business News. And it says the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative received a national recognition recently from the Smart Electric Power Alliance, or SEPA, a mainland-based non-for-profit affiliated with more than 700 utility companies. 
Deepa named KIUC one of the eight power players of the year and electric cooperative of the year. The nonprofit said in its announcement that KIUC is unique in the world in achieving 100% renewable or nearly on nearly a daily basis. KIUC's transition to renewables has resulted in more stable, lower rates as members are increasingly buffered from financial impacts of volatile oil pricing and benefit from a majority of their power being supplied via long-term power purchase agreements that are competitively or lower priced compared to fossil fuels. It was the first such award for KIUC having been selected over fellow finalists, Cobb Electric Membership Corporation of Georgia and Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative in its category for electric cooperatives. In the video compilation of the winners, KIUC President and CEO David Bissell talked about KIUC's eight utility scale photovoltaic systems and 5,500 yeah, 5, customer installed systems. He said three of the utility scale projects have battery systems that can store the project's full capacity at four to five hours at a time. And the most recent of those is a 14 megawatt system operating at AES Pacific Missile Range, which is a Navy, um, Navy facility at Barking Sands with microgrid storage capability. KAUC has entered international recognition, has earned international recognition by moving its small island grid assertively forward towards 100% clean power generation in just 10 years. This will told Pacific News in an email, by achieving 67% renewable in 2020, operating at 100% renewal on almost daily basis for a cumulative total of thousands of hours since 2019. They're leading the state in reliable reliability last year and providing great stability for members at KIUC, demonstrating clean energy future is within reach. And I picked the story because it's, it's exactly what I was talking about. KIUC didn't try and convert their system in one year or two years. And they're not a big utility by, by state standards or certainly by national standards, but they're not a simple utility either. They have some pretty isolated communities. They have, um, they have limited space to put these photovoltaic arrays. Um, they have a lot of tourism, so they, they don't want to be spoiling their natural beauty by putting in wind turbines and, and, and other things like that. And they've managed to do it. And they've managed to do it in a thoughtful way that uses cradle to grave analysis, critical thinking. And I just think that it was great to see uh, KIUC uh, get recognized for, for doing, doing what we've been talking about and not fighting a war over energy, but just fighting to make clean energy. That's going to do it for Stand the Energy Man this week. And I look forward to talking to you uh, next week. Until then, aloha.